today then we're going to talk about the chirality of life. Chirality is a geometrical property that we have in three dimensions. An example is our left and right hands. They're distinct. We cannot overlap them and get them to fall into place. Also the antlers of goats or sheep, you find the chirality. And in the shells, in seashells, for example, these two seashells have different chir chirality and you cannot superimpose one on top of the other one. And even down to these microscopic organisms, which are called diatoms, which live on the sea surface, which do photosynthesis. And the shells are made up of silica, but you can also see that they have also the two chir chiralities. So these two chiralities exist in nature. And these are just some examples. There are many more examples, of course, of chirality in nature. Now, chirality exists even all the way down to molecules, to these organic molecules. So this molecule, for instance, is an amino acid. It has this carboxyl group and the amino group uh, attached to a carbon. This is called the alpha carbon. It has four covalent bonds available to it. One is attached to the hydrogen, this carboxyl group, and the, uh, the amine group. And then we have uh, a particular, for example, if it's hydrogen here, this is a particular group also. It's hydrogen, then we have glycine, which is the most simplest amino acid. If it's, for example, an aromatic ring, then we could have tryptophan or tyrosine or phenylalanine. So depending on this group R, that makes the amino acid. But now we see that because of the fact that we have this alpha carbon with four possible covalent bonds, we can have two molecules which are really chiral, one left hand and one right handed. Okay, and there's no way that you can fit these two structures together. They're different. In, in space, they are different. But in terms of energy, for example, the Gibbs free energy at constant temperature and pressure, they are the same. They are degenerate. Now, they're not exactly degenerate because there is a force, which we'll talk about in one of the following slides called the weak force in which there is a violation of what is known as parity. And uh, parity is like reflection in a mirror. And if there's a little violation in this weak force, then in fact, the energies of these two molecules, the Gibbs free energy will be slightly different, but it's a very small amount. But anyway, uh, that difference, the non-conservation of parity in the weak force is one of the explanations for the homochirality of the molecules in life. Because unlike these macroscopic examples, when we get down to the molecular level, then we find that life is made up of left-handed amino acids, and right-handed DNA. So this is the case of amino acids. This is a left-handed. And this is the case of DNA. So you know here we have a base, which is adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. We have a sugar, ribose sugar. And then we have the phosphate groups. But you can imagine you could put the base on one side or the other. So we look at this as being two chiral molecules, actually distinct molecules. This is right-handed DNA, and this is left-handed DNA. 
And when you make the structure, when you pile the bases up together and connect them, then we get two different forms for the, these uh, DNA segments or RNA segments. One is right-handed and the other one is left-handed. But the curious thing is that in nature, almost, well, in fact, all of the DNA are right-handed and all of the amino acids are left-handed. So that's a curious fact now. So the question is how the homo, homo chirality of life came to be. And it seems to be something which began very early during the origin of life, because as you can notice that if uh, we have an extension of DNA, that is when we have one strand and we're making a complementary strand. Okay, and if we put the wrong chirality of the base with the sugar and the, and the phosphate groups into the system, then we can no longer have hydrogen bonding between the conjugate base pairs like adenine and thymine, guanine and cytosine. This base here will be on this side of the molecule of DNA. So it, what happens when, uh, for example, left-handed uh, base gets incorporated into the DNA structure, then it interrupts the extension. So we cannot have extension, so we cannot have copying. So this system stops and that's as far as we get. So therefore, we require all of these bases with their sugar and their phosphate groups, uh, like for example, uh, aden adenosine triphosphatone, we require them to be all of one chirality and not mixed chirality. They could be all right-handed or they could be all left-handed. It turns out in nature that they're all right-handed. So that is the big question then. How did chirality come to be incorporated into the origin of life? And it must have been at the very beginning of life, as I mentioned, because we cannot even have replication of DNA unless we have homo chirality. All of the bases and their sugars with their phosphates have the same chirality. So just to remind you again, that we can have plain polarized light. And that is the case in which uh, the vibrations are in a single plane in space. And remember here, this can be the vibrations of the electrical field or the magnetic field. The magnetic field is at right angles to the electric field. Uh, that is called plane polarization. If the light has no polarization, then the particular planes are arbitrary. So it's a random mixture. Now we can also have circular polarization. When a plane polarized light beam is internally scattered, totally internally scattered from an interface, then we can get circular polarized light. And this is where the the amplitudes of the, these oscillations, they rotate around the direction of motion of the photon or the light beam. So this is the case of circularly polarized light. And uh, that is interesting light for us because it will help to distinguish between whether we have left-handed or right-handed DNA, or we have left-handed and right-handed amino acids because there's a little bit difference in absorption. For example, left-handed circularly polarized light will absorb more on left-handed amino acids than on right-handed amino acids and the other way around also. So um, right-handed circularly polarized light will absorb more on right-handed amino acids, a little bit more. It's only a few, uh, fraction decimals of a percent and uh, than it would on uh, right-handed 
So depending on the circular polarization of the light, we can distinguish what molecule we're talking about. And it turns out, in fact, at least according to what we are postulating, that the light, the circular polarization of the light, is in fact what is driving the homo chirality of life. So just to remind you again, then the light, the spectrum that we're interested in is really in the ultraviolet, because this is where we have enough energy in a single photon to break and remake carbon covalent bonds. So at about 260 nanometers is uh, where we are. We need to be looking at the circular polarization of light. Okay, but we'll get into that in more detail. So this is the complete spectrum, which goes all the way up from uh, cosmic rays, gamma rays, and all the way down to long waves, uh, uh, radio waves, and even longer waves. You know? And so the wavelength can go until infinite. Well, depending on the size of the universe and uh, the shortness can go well uh, to what is known as the Planck distance because space is uh, quantized also. Okay, so let me first go through the traditional explanations for the homo chirality of the molecules of life, of the fundamental molecules of life. Well, perhaps the most famous or the, the theory most uh, plausible so far is that we got to that state of homo, homo chirality by the photolysis of the precursor molecules. Okay, so what they're suggesting, what the authors of this theory suggest is that if we have a pulsar, now a pulsar is a star which has collapsed. If it was a little bit bigger, it would have collapsed into a black hole. But if it's about, I'm not, not exactly sure, but about 2.5 times the size of our sun, it will collapse not into a black hole, but into a neutron star. And so then you have this Pauli repulsion between the neutrons, which keeps the system from collapsing further into a black hole. So it depends on the mass of the star that you initially start with. So when it finishes its fuel, it has no more uh, pressure because of the temperature within the star drops. So that pressure drops and the star begins to collapse. And then as uh, they've showed that it can collapse into a black hole or into a neutron star, depending on the mass. Now a neutron star has a radius of uh, tens of kilometers. So let's say about the size of the district of Federal, for instance, which is about 14 kilometers. So all of the mass, all of the angular momentum that the star had before it collapsed is now in this small region of about 14, 15 kilometers, which is called the neutron star. So you can imagine that that star has to be rotating extremely rapidly. And uh, these stars, because they are rotating so rapidly, and because they have uh, the charges which have been separated from the protons, so they're, they're only neutron stars, so there are electrons on the surface of that star. And that rotation, because of the electric charge, produces this very, very strong magnetic fields. And these strong magnetic fields interact with the light which is being emitted by the star, which is dipole interaction. And uh, that can affect the circular polarization. It can be either left or right-handed, depending on the hemisphere that you're looking at, either from above or from below. So you can imagine, let's say that we had a region of gas and dust in one hemisphere. And let's say that we have ultraviolet light of very short wavelength so that we can photolyze what we mean by photolysis is that the photon can be absorbed on the molecule and the molecule starts to break itself apart because we start losing electrons on the molecule and then we're losing the bonding between the atoms. So the molecule breaks apart. So that's called photolysing or photodestruction, 
feel like another way of saying it. So for example, if we have a racemic mixture, and by racemic, I mean that we have equal amounts of, let's say, left-handed and right-handed amino acids. If we started with this racemic mixture and exposed it to this light, which let's say in this lower hemisphere has a component of left-handed circularly polarized light, then the left-handed amino acids would, will absorb a little bit more than the right-handed amino acids. Not much more, but a little bit more. And if they absorb a little bit more, then they are more prone to destruction of photolysis. So we will start to destroy the left-handed amino acids. But we would also be destroying right-handed amino acids, acids just not in such great quantity because left-handed circularly polarized light can also be absorbed on right-handed amino acids, but with a little less um, absorption coefficient. So the right-handed um, amino acids are also destroyed by the left-handed circularly polarized light, but not at the same rate as the right-handed amino acids. So over time, you can imagine getting a, a certain buildup of the chirality. So for example, in this plot here, this is again the pulsar, which is emitting the circular polarized light. And it's, let's say it's acting on these different uh, adenosine or, or, or guanine. These are bases with the sugar and with the phosphate group. And so let's say at the, at the bottom, we have left-handed circularly polarized light. So we tend to absorb more on this structure than it would on this structure. So it would cause a little bit more destruction of the left-handed uh, symmetries, a little bit more. So that is this, this line in red here. And uh, the right-handed would also be destroyed. So if we start with a concentration of these two being equal, Okay, and then we look at their concentrations as a function of their initial concentration. And we will find that left-handed would start to go down a little bit more quickly than right-handed. So it would be destroying more and more, and eventually we'll get to zero. Uh, now the right-handed would not be being destroyed as rapidly, so we would get a little bit increase in the amount after a certain time period. So that gives us some kind of difference uh, between the two chiralities. So we would have more right-handed and left-handed. We start with them being equal, equal number of right-handed and left-handed. And we end up after this photolysis effect from the neutron star, we end up having a little bit more right-handed DNA than left-handed DNA. So, well, that's the theory. And it seems to be the only theory which is uh, certainly considered with any uh, importance. But we have another problem with the same theory is that, okay, so let's say these molecules were produced in space and they were produced near to some kind of a pulsar. The question is how did they get to Earth? Well, they have to, they would have to come to Earth through formation into a meteorite, which eventually landed on Earth's surface, no? or was incorporated with a material which formed Earth itself at the beginning of the, the construction of the solar system. But if it came in as a meteorite after the formation of the Earth, then uh, you can imagine that the material would be brought to very high temperatures. And when you bring material to very high temperatures, then you can go back. Let's say there is a, an energy barrier between these two, okay? Or if we go back to the amino acids, let's say there's an energy barrier between the left and the right-handed amino acid. But if you uh, give temperature, apply temperature to the system, then the system can jump over the barriers. And so even though you start with an initial chirality, which is not equal for the two ent entitomers, 
they can, by this uh, heating effect, go back to be basically equal proportions. So we go from this graph, the bottom here, we go back again to what it was at the beginning, this, the same concentrations of these two. So I should say that these, the energies for producing these two molecules, the Gibbs free energy, is basically the same except for this component of the weak force, which we'll mention in a minute. But it could have an energy barrier between them. And uh, this energy barrier can be